even here in Lawrence, we don't know exactly how many people were killed in Quantrell's raid. It's not like now where everything's on the internet and you know there's news and it's reliable news and there's cameras and everyone has phones that have cameras on them. This is all something very different back then. And remember, sometimes money can make things disappear. My name is Paul Thomas. Uh, I'm a library specialist at the University of Kansas, and I'm the author of Haunted Lawrence. So right now I'm standing in front of the Sigma Nu House, which is located in Lawrence, Kansas, kind of in the very middle of the continental United States. Lawrence nowadays has kind of a, a reputation as a college town, you know, where this is where the University of Kansas is located. But it was founded hundreds of years ago, right before the period during the Civil War. Um, it was founded by free staters who came to the state of Kansas in the hopes of having the state enter into the Union as a free state rather than a slave state. is kind of your quirky friend that always brings excitement to your backyard barbecue. We have something for every interest. We have an amazing history and we're also founded on a social movement. So we have really good history of social change. Um, famously, it was destroyed by William Quantrail in 1863 when his Confederate guerrillas ran through here and burned the downtown district. It's seen a lot of bloodshed. There's been a lot of violence. And in many ways, it's sort of a crucible where these two factions of American history colli uh, collided and clashed, and a lot of blood was spilled for that reason. Um, for, that, for that reason alone, I think Lawrence has kind of this spooky history because its history is very literally spooky. A lot of people died, a lot of blood was shed, and there were many stories that kind of came out of that tradition. So the story of Sigma Nu is one wrapped up in history as well as legend. Basically, a long time ago, this house was built by Governor Stubbs, who was uh, the governor of the state of Kansas in 1911. Walter Roscoe Stubbs was born in 1858 and was elected Kansas governor in November of 1908. In his life before politics, Walter Stubbs was a successful businessman. According to the Kansas Historical Society, Stubbs was a staunch activist in the Kansas Republican Progressive Wing. Yeah, Governor Stubbs was born in Indiana in 1858, but at some point in his childhood, I know his family moved to a farm in, in Hesper, Kansas. And Hesper is part of the Dora Township, so it's in what we call the Dora area. And Hesper is still there. It's a very, very small town, maybe you know, a dozen houses, maybe less, than a, a Quaker church. Uh, it was founded in the 1850s as a Quaker community along the Oregon Trail. Uh, 
and it was a passionately anti-slavery community. Uh, at that time, there were um, a lot of battles being fought in Kansas over uh, slavery. Uh, a lot of people wanted to bring slavery into Kansas, a lot of people wanted to stop it, and the Quakers at Settled Hesper were against slavery. Um, and so I know that um, being a Quaker undoubtedly influenced Governor Stubbs' life and his outlook. I know his family was pretty poor. I know they had to suffer through uh, the grasshopper plague in 1874 that would have probably destroyed all their crops. So I know they faced a lot of hardships. And I'm sure the, the Quakers' more progressive political beliefs probably influenced his progressive political beliefs when he was governor. My name is Beth Cornegay, and I've been a ghost tour guide with Ghost Tours of Kansas for 12 or 13 years. One of the things that I really like and appreciate about the Sigma Nu House is that the students that live there, the fraternity brothers, the Sigma Nu fraternity, um, they will come down and they will tell us their stories. And you can tell that they're, they're very true stories. They don't go, uh, yeah, uh, this one time, ha, ha, ha. You know, they tell us their stories. And you can tell, I mean, when they tell their stories, if they're standing next to me, sometimes even the hair on their arm will raise as they tell us about how a light goes on in their closet. They're all firsthand stories, things that they have seen themselves. So my first big story, I'd say, um, and weirdest thing that happened to me is one time on a just a sober night, I had not been drinking at all. Um, I think it was like a Tuesday, uh, school week. I was in the racks and uh, I, uh, I woke up randomly. You know, when, you know when you wake up to someone waking you up versus when you wake up on your own, you notice? Um, so I was startled awake. And that freaked me out a little bit. And um, I was just, I was on a top, a top bunk and I'm like looking, looking across the room, it's pitch black, but in the corner of the room, I see a dark shadow, okay? I'm like, okay, it could be my friend, it could be someone in the back of the room. I'm like, yo, who is that? No one says anything, but the shadow moves. And I'm like, okay, so something weird is going on here. Um, I'm like, what is going on? The shadow moves kind of slowly, like doesn't, doesn't turn. The shadow doesn't change like uh, shape or anything. It just moves. Um, and I'm thinking in my head, where is it? So I'm scrambling to find my phone. I can't find my phone anywhere. And I look up in the shadows in a different part of the room. And I'm like, okay, someone's messing with me. I'm like, yo, like one of my pledge brothers, like, who is that? Like, what are you doing? No answer. And then it moves and kind of disappears. And so I'm like, okay, so freaked out because one, there was a shadow that I didn't know who it was. The shadow was obviously not an animal, like a little mouse. This was like a human looking shadow. And it almost resembled a woman in a gown in a lot of ways because if you think about a woman in a gown, it's like you see the top part of the heart, head curves and then it like goes like that, kind of spreads out. That's what it looked like. And that was, the, that was by far the weirdest part because I didn't even know, but I learned uh, two days later, I, had t I was talking to like guys that, that were in the house about two years older than me. And I was like, I saw the shadow of a woman in a gown in our sleeping dorm. And they were like, that's insane because that's what every person says um, that are years older than us that they say they have seen shadows of a woman or they've seen a woman in a gown, in a white gown that are roaming the halls of our house. Um, and that was by far the weirdest thing is when I described that not knowing about the ghost per se and then describing that and telling that to someone who had said that's what everyone like accounts. definitely freaked me out a lot because I was thinking in my head, holy moly, this is no longer just a story. This became very real to me in my mind. So I've always been really interested in the Sigma Nu story for a number of reasons. Uh, chief among them is the fact that the Sigma Nu house itself looks like something out of Scooby-Doo. Uh, just seems like the perfect place for some sort of ghost to be lurking. It's also probably one of the most traditional ghost stories uh, that I found in the Lawrence area. It 
has all the hallmarks of a great haunting, you know, ghost with long black hair and a white gown, roaming the halls late at night, scaring college students. What isn't there to love about it? The Sigma Nu Fraternity House is one of my favorite stories in the Lawrence tour. So it was originally built for Governor Roscoe Stubbs, and he lived there while he was taking care of business in Topeka, and he would make frequent tri trips back and forth. So as was common for the time, they had help, because you know what a giant house that is. So he lived there with his family, and they had people that helped in the barn, people that helped in the stables, people that helped in the field, and they also had help in the house. And one of those helpers inside was a 14-year-old girl named Virginia. So Virginia was supposedly a maid of the governor. Um, she was said to be a very beautiful woman who you know, all the, the locals of Lawrence either uh, liked as a daughter or fancied, you know, as a potential uh, a wife, you might say. Um, and there was a lot of rumors about Virginia. Why was she working with the governor? Why was the governor and her so close? What exactly was going on? Both the governor and Virginia insisted that they were, you know, strictly a work relationship and that while the governor probably did care for her like maybe a daughter, you know, there was nothing between them, that it was strictly platonic. Others, however, said that the governor had taken Virginia on as his paramour and that secretly the two were lovers. And um, she apparently was, you know, quite a lovely lady and um, really enjoyed, the family enjoyed getting to know her and they really became uh, enamored with her, especially Governor Stubbs, who um, became apparently more involved than he should have. And um, when Governor Stubbs went to Topeka to take care of some governor business, he came back and he found his wife rocking back and forth in a rocking chair in an agitated state. So in 1911, obviously, there were not as many technological amenities as we have now. Um, and you know, the distance from Lawrence is only a short drive today, but back then it was probably an hour, if not maybe a little more. I picture that when the governor was coming home, he was perhaps in an old, you know, antique car, maybe even horseback, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I can't imagine that it would have been an easy trip back. By the time he pulled up here, he was almost certainly tired and, you know, just ready to go to bed or eat dinner or, or perhaps, you know, chat with Virginia, his favorite maid. So when he opened that door and didn't find her, I think the exhaustion of his trip probably compounded the fear that he was feeling by her not being there. She was a calming presence someone who, when he came home, he could always look forward to seeing after a very busy day in the Capitol. And when she wasn't there, you know, he started to panic. And he found Virginia hanging by the neck um, from the third floor in the ballroom. When it comes to the, the wife sitting in the chair, when I, when I see her, I see her rocking very slowly, her back turned from the governor. And when he finally, you know, kind of sees her face, it's just, her eyes are just bulging out of her skull and she obviously looks traumatized. Something terrible has happened. But the question of course is, did she witness someone kill themselves? Or did she kill someone? And is this kind of her, you know, her guilt manifesting right here before us? This episode of Free State Horror Stories is brought to you by these fine Kansas-based businesses. Laser One Pest Management. Also by LKS Imagine. Support from Mr. CP 
and central play of music, Midwestern hip hop that stops short of gangster rap. Follow Mr. CP on Spotify for his upcoming album. Free State Horror Stories will be back in 60 seconds. My name is Richard Holman. I'm a managing owner of LKS Imagine here in Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, we do embroidery, garment printing, sublimation. So we can embroider just about anything that is cloth, leather, you know, even vinyl. We enjoy what we do here. You know, someone is always coming in with an idea and they want to see it fleshed out. And when they get that item and it looks as good or even better than they expected, that's a, it's a real plus. Everything that we do regarding our embroidery is custom tailored for the customer themselves. At Laser One Pest Management, we believe that you have enough scary things going on in your life right now. Termites, mice, and bed bugs shouldn't be one of them. At Laser One, we remove those horrors from your life. And we are also hiring if you want to rescue local families with us. Visit laser1pm.com to chat with us if you have any questions about pest control. Now, enjoy the rest of Free State Horror Stories. One thing that you'll notice when you go into the home itself is it's incredibly gorgeous. It's got a lot of the old woodwork and uh, the fireplace inside is pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, on the fireplace you'll see there's a brass plate and it says the world of strife shut out, the world of love shut in. So he let himself in. He couldn't find her anywhere. He was roaming the halls, trying to find where, where is Virginia, until he finally went up to the very top floor where at the time there was a ballroom. And when he opened those doors, he saw Virginia hanging from the chandelier. Um, he didn't know what was going on. It, it looked like suicide, so, but he still couldn't quite figure out what made her want to do that. Uh, he eventually found his wife out on one of these rooftop balconies sitting in a chair, shaken and completely out of it. And so he started to connect the pieces, the story goes. Uh, maybe his wife had killed Virginia because she was jealous of the attention that he had given her. And so they say that the, the governor's wife was sent to an insane asylum. So after this gruesome event, it's said that the governor had the body of Virginia cremated and then placed in the wall of a fireplace. And then over that fireplace, he had a nice mantle placed that says, the world of strife shut out, the world of love shut in. So people took that to mean, of course, that the body of Virginia was in the wall and that the hatred that she had experienced, potentially at the hands of the governor's wife, was you know, pushed out, uh, not allowed into the house. So uh, Governor Stubbs had her cremated and her remains are in the fireplace itself. Well, that's creepy. However, there's a lot of stories that go along with that. So fast forward. 1920, Sigma Nu fraternity purchases the house. And so the legend continues that in April of every year, the people who live in the Sigma Nu house see Virginia's apparition wandering the halls. She, she's said to be in a white gown, with long black hair. She can often be found looking out windows or walking up and down stairways. Uh, she's scared a lot of fraternity guys, but from what we can tell, she's not a malicious spirit. She just is attached to the property and calls it her home. I mean, I have two different um, thoughts on that. My, my personal belief is that I don't believe in ghosts or Bigfoot or, you know, religion. I don't believe anything that's not easily proven by science. And then my other belief is that, my professional belief is that as a museum, uh, I think it's our job to stick to fact rather than speculation, rather than things that aren't easily proven. That's my, my professional belief. Can you just describe what it is you're sitting in front of right now? Yeah, right now I'm sitting in front of the Hesper Curtain, uh, which is from the Hesper Schoolhouse which was uh, in the Hesper community. 
They last held classes at the Hesper School in the 1950s, and sadly they tore it down in the 1960s. So this curtain behind me is really all that's left of it. And this was the, the stage curtain for the, the school's um, stage. So they could have raised and lowered this when they had performances on that stage. Governor Stubbs' political career, I believe, started in 1902 when he was first elected to the state representatives of Douglas County. And I believe at that point, even early on, he was opposed to, at the time, a lot of the parties were dominated by party bosses, and it was viewed as somewhat corrupt. And I know even early on, Stubbs opposed the party bosses, and he allied himself with the progressives to try to reform the Republican Party, uh, to bring it um, more in line with progressive ideals rather than party bosses that controlled patronage and so forth. One of his big causes was women's suffrage. Uh, Kansas was one of the first states to grant women um, the full right to vote in 1912, which was eight years ahead of the rest of the country, which uh, didn't uh, get the right to vote until 1920. And I know Governor Stubbs' wife, Stella, was a very passionate activist on women's suffrage as well. Governor Stubbs was such a supporter of women's suffrage that he actually loaned his car um, to suffragettes uh, while they campaigned across the state, across the region for uh, women's right to vote. Uh, Governor Stubbs, I believe, oversaw the acceleration of prohibition in Kansas uh, during that time period. Kansas was ahead of the country in a lot of areas back then. It was ahead of the country in terms of national prohibition, which I believe was enacted in 1919, 1920. Um, so he was um, kind of leading the cause ahead of a lot of other states on that issue. Eudora was a German town, and um, overwhelmingly so. We, I looked at some of the documents from back then, and I think like 99% of Eudora people voted against prohibition when it was on the ballot in the 1880s, so it was a very uh, unpopular topic in Eudora at the time. When you flash forward to Governor Stubbs's career, I think at that point maybe people were a bit more um, less passionate on the issue, but I, and I'm not fully sure on that. <laughs> well, at the time, uh, in the 19th century, and especially uh, in a lot of places in Kansas, uh, a lot of people, particularly women, were prohibitionists. They were really opposed to alcohol. They thought alcohol was destroying American society. Um, and to some extent, you know, they had a legitimate complaint because there was a lot of men who would um, consume way too much alcohol and they'd come home drunk and, you know, they wouldn't be able to work, they wouldn't be able to function. So a lot of temperance um, movements started to get set up in the 19th century. And I know the Quakers were part of that movement. And I know they thought that it was a moral question. They thought that alcohol was immoral and they took it upon themselves to try to um, enact prohibition. Kansas was really the leading state in that movement, and it was considered part of the progressive movement. Um, and I believe Kansas was the first state to outlaw alcohol in 1881. And we also have another story. This happened on one of our tours. My husband James was giving the tour that night and told me uh, that uh, we had two tours. So there was an eight o'clock tour and a 10 o'clock tour. So the eight o'clock tour, uh, they stopped by the Sigma New House and they were having a party. So because they were having a party and it's a private residence, we didn't bother them at all. So we just kind of told the stories from the bus. Well, during the storytelling, uh, they started playing the Ghostbuster song and they had, you know, the guys, they dressed up, they had the backpacks on, so they, it was like they were on the Ghostbusters movie. And then they had a girl dressed up like Virginia come out, and then they sprayed her with, you know, silly string, that sort of thing. And then they, when they went back for the 10 o'clock tour, they kind of expected the same thing to happen, but they didn't. So it's like, oh, well, that's too bad, but, a couple years later, I was telling that story and one of the guys said because they went inside 
and you know they all had a good laugh we just scared the people that were here for the ghost tour and they got a big kick out of it and everything one of the girls that was there at the party um, said something like you know Virginia if you're real give me a sign and a beer bottle that was sitting on the ledge exploded so they were not messing with that anymore so they were done so they knew that they were just going to leave well enough alone and not do uh, the little play again Well, it's nice to narrow it down to one person, but if you look at history and try to narrow it down to Benjamin Franklin, you lose a lot of history. Okay, so there are a lot more people in that space. 